is that really in the Bible? You live in a world where everyone has an opinion about the Bible. Of what values are your beliefs if they are not clearly found in the pages of your Bible? The question we must ask is, are your opinions and beliefs really found in the Bible? Well, hello, I'm David Freeman with Is That Really in the Bible? You know, presidents are evaluated for their first 100 days in office. And what I want to look at today is the first 100 days in office of Jesus Christ's presidency when he returns to this earth to set up his kingdom on this earth. Now, first of all, we have to go back and remember the angel's message was... In Acts 1 and verse 11, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So where is it that Christ is going to return? Well, the Bible gives you the answer in Zechariah 14 and verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. Now, how does our Savior return? How does Jesus Christ return to this earth? Well, let's look at this amazing scripture, Revelation 19 and verse 16. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, you might think, okay, when Christ returns, he's going to be welcomed with open arms. And you'd be greatly deceived if you believe that. Let's notice how Jesus is received when he returns to this earth. You know, do all the people just have a big smile on their face and praise God, here comes our Savior to set up his kingdom on this earth? Well, let's take a look at it. Revelation 17 and verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called chosen and faithful. Now notice this. When Christ starts his presidency, he's not alone. He's not all by himself. He has resurrected and brings with him those that are called chosen, and faithful. In other words, by this time, the saints have been resurrected, and he brings with him, he has with him the saints. Now, are you aware of the fact that for, for the past 2,000 years, Jesus Christ has been calling out his cabinet members? Just exactly like when a president comes to power he will select his cabinet members. Okay, Jesus has been doing this for the past 2,000 years. He calls them, he chooses them, he is calling and choosing his cabinet members. Those who have been faithful are promised this. Let's notice it, Revelation 2 and verse 26. And he that overcometh and keeps my works until the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall be broken into shivers, even as I have received of my Father. Notice that. He shall rule them with, that is, rule nations with a rod of iron. Christ returns to this earth with his saints. Jude 1 and verse 14 says, The Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Now, to do what? Let's ask that question. Well, the next verse answers the question. What is Christ going to do when he returns with his saints? Jude 1 and verse 15. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Let me tell you something. Christ with his saints, is they are going to kick ASS. I don't know of any better way to put it. 
I don't know of any polite way of putting that. I don't know of any religious. Oh, you shouldn't say that. We all love Jesus. I'm, I'm offended by what you just said. Well, get over it. Get over it. Do you know why men don't like church? There's nothing there for them is the reason. Men are warriors. Well, there's nothing to war at church. I mean, you've got a bunch of passive, pasty-faced, weak, whimsical religious people, you know, listening to a bunch of pablum that you wouldn't feed a baby to. There's nothing in church for men. Men are warriors. They really are. And men need something to fight for. So the first days of Jesus' presidency, when Christ returned to this earth, first thing that's going to happen is installing the teams. He's going to install the teams with the saints. Now, like I said, the teams have, all, by this time, the teams have already been chosen, his cabinet members, because like I said, Christ has been calling his cabinet members for the past 2,000 years. So he's going to install the teams. The first thing he's going to do when he returns is to install the team. teams. The resurrected saints will be immortal and you cannot be killed at this point. Now this is important. Don't overlook this fact. When you're resurrected with Christ, you are immortal. You cannot be killed. Bullets go straight through you. Okay, that's a good thing. Because you see, we're going to have to put down evil in the world. All the ungodly sinners that are out there, we're going to have to put them down, okay? For example, in dealing with the promoters of pornography, let's say the mafia. Yeah, because they're in that big time. The mafia is in promoting pornography. In other words, you're going to go and you're going to say, look, we're no longer going to degrade our women with pornography. Pornography no more. Now, if you tried that today, I mean, if you walked up to the mafia today or, or tried to, you know, if you were dealing with the promoters of pornography today and you told them that, you know, you'd end up with a, a Colombian necktie. I'm not sure you know what that is, but it's when they, well, it's gross. I mean, but it's when they slit your throat and they take your tongue and stick it out like a necktie, out, your, out that little slit. Yeah, that's called a Colombian necktie. So you got to understand why it's so important when this time comes for us to be changed and given immortality. Because when you're given immortality, you can't be killed. And, and the only way you can put down evil, because you're going to have to realize what you're up against. You're going to be up against ungodly sinners that are not going to want to listen to you a bit. Notice, when Christ returns, the armies turn and fight against God. That's how rebellious our society is going to be when Jesus returns to this earth. Let's notice Psalms 149, verse 7. It says, To execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written, this honor have all the saints. Praise ye the Lord. Notice this. This honor is going to be given to the saints. To do what? Well, to kick, you know what? <laughs> That's the honor is going to be given to the saints. Can, can you relate to that? Now, if you're a man, I guarantee you, you can relate to this. When is this honor coming for the saints? Well, it's coming at Christ's first 100 days of, of Jesus Christ's ministry, of uh, presidency, excuse me, on this earth. And his second ministry, I should say. All right. Okay. The second thing that's going to be done is to drain the swamp. To drain, Christ is going to drain the swamp. Jude 1 and verse 15, again, let's read it. To execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. All right, let's talk about how the swamp is going to be drained. Revelation 20 and verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of that dragon, the, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. You know, one of the meanings of the Day of Atonement uh, is one of the holy days that I keep. Of course, our society has rejected. Christianity has rejected the holy days and it keeps its own 
holidays like Christmas, Easter, Halloween. Uh, but these days have been rejected. You know, people say, oh, they're Jewish. They're Mosaic. They're for Israel. They're for somebody else. And yet they're in the Bible. And they're referred to as the Feast of Jehovah. And yet we're not keeping them. Well, anyway, this Day of Atonement represents a day, not only the atoning work of Jesus Christ, but that there's coming a day that this scripture looks forward to when Satan is going to be bound no more. I mean, that's one of the ways you drain the swamp is you bind this evil being. The swamp is going to be drained of all of its immorality. Revelation 11 and verse 18. And the nations were angry and thy wrath is come and the end the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should give reward unto your servants, the prophets, and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. Now, what is this about? Destroy them that destroy the earth. Now, there's a passage back in Genesis, the first murder that occurred, this little comment that God makes, it says, and the voice of your brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. You know, our nation is a bloody nation. And the blood that is spilt continuously, like a bloody swamp soaking into the ground, cries out to God. I mean, we could talk about all the murders. We could talk about the 50 million abortions. Yeah. And, and you know, it, this verse talks about, okay, destroy them which are destroying the earth. Like I said, the earth's ground is bloody. And all the blood of our murders and abortions are crying out to God, the blood is. And we've got to stop those who are destroying the earth. Now, another concept I want you to think about is in Leviticus 26 and verse 34. It says, Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths, as long as it lies desolate and you be in your enemy's land, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when you dwelt upon it. You know, God is saying, look, you people worked yourself to death and, and there was supposed to be a land rest every seventh year. We were to let our land rest so that it would replenish for one year, so that it would replenish the nutrients in the ground. We don't do that. We haven't done that in I don't know when. And our food has no nutritional value. There's no enzyme, there's no vitamins, there's no minerals in our foods, our vegetables, our fruits. There's nothing because we don't let the land rest. And you end up in an old folks home and you can't even wipe your own butts because there's nothing, our food is not doing us any good. And there's cancer and there's all kinds of things that we're getting constantly. And we're sick, sick, sick. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, the first 100 days of Jesus' presidency. Third point, free global health care. Now, you do know this is only something God can do, but Isaiah 35 and verse 5 then shall the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sling. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the deserts. I love that. Streams in the deserts. Now how? How is this global health care going to come about? Revelation 22 and verse 2 answers the question. In the midst of the streets of it, and on either side of the river, there was a tree of life, which bare 12 manners of fruits and yielded her fruits every month. And the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Now, I want to tell you something. Even right now, I mean, yeah, I know this is future, but right now, a lot could be said about natural herbs, plants, roots for our healing. It's just that we don't we don't have enough information yet. And of course, we're at war with the pharmaceutical companies that want to push their prescription medicine because there's so much money in that. And of course, natural products, you can't make any money off that. But stuff like, you know, like marijuana, the other side, I forget what's that called, hemp oil. Yeah, hemp oil, the byproduct or, or, uh, of marijuana. I mean, the, the incredible healing benefit of that. 
You know, I mean, just there's a lot of stuff we don't know about, about healing natural remedies, natural healings of leaves and trees and barks and uh, plants and roots and, and all of this stuff, herbs. You know, there's just a lot of ways, things that we don't know about right now that could be used for our healing. Absolutely. Okay, first day, the first 100 days of Christ's presidency, the fourth thing is reforming the economy. To reform the economy, basically there's going to be a simple tax, 10%. Yeah, Malachi 3 and verse 10 says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now wherewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open your windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, and there shall not be room enough to receive it. Yeah, simple tax, 10%. You know, God can do more with 10% of your income than the government can do with 36% or 40% or half your income. Yeah. Do you know what your, your you know, far as taxes, what it goes for is, such as to fund abortions through Planned Parenthood? Yeah. Or to sponsor the National Endowment of the Arts? You remember the story they came out with? The, it was spark, this, this art thing. They called it art. It was, it was entitled Piss Christ. It was a crucifix in a bottle of urine. And your tax dollars went in part to sponsor that. The National Endowment for the Arts. Yeah. Your tax dollars, right? Okay. No more of that crazy nonsense is going to be going on when Christ returns and sets up his presidency on this earth. Isaiah 30 and verse 23, Then shall he give the rain of thy seed, that thou shalt sow the ground with all and bread of the increase of the earth, and it shall be fat and plenteous. In the day shall thy cattle feed in large pastures. So God is going to reform the economy. Fifth thing he's going to do is rebuild the infrastructure. Isaiah 58 and verse 12 says, And they sh that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt rise up the foundations of many generations. And you shall be called the preparers of the breach, the restorers of path to dwell in. Isaiah 50, 35 and verse 8 says, And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err, err therein. Yeah, it's not going to be fool. There's going to be a major highway as far as rebuilding the infrastructure, but there's not going to be any fools on this, on this highway. And another thing is important to understand about rebuilding, to rebuild the infrastructure, at the end of the, this thousand year reign of Christ on this earth, there's going to be a, time, a massive influx of people when the rest of the dead are raised. You know, the Valley of Dry Bone, Ezekiel 37, where it talks about this resurrection of billions of people that are going to come up at this time. And that's the reason this infrastructure is going to have to be rebuilt to prepare the way for this influx of billions of people. The sixth thing God is going to do is to reestablish the true worship of God. To reestablish the true worship of God. Hebrews 8 and verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. I mean, this is, this is a powerful scripture. You know, because, I mean, you know, you got people running around today sometimes telling, asking, do you know the Lord, brother? And the problem is they don't even know the Lord. They're trying to teach me something that they don't know about. Uh, but at this time, God says, all shall know me, from the least to the greatest, reestablishing the true worship of God. All people on the same page. Okay. Not a 
not 450,000 different concepts, ideas, some kind of hodgepodge of, of this idea, this queer idea about God, about religion, and about spirituality. No, all people on the same page. Isaiah 66 and verse 23 says this, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, says the Lord. Yeah, this is a time when everybody will be on the same page. The seventh thing God's going to do is restoring worldwide peace. You know, your Bible says the way of peace they know not. And that is so true. We just don't know the way to peace. I was watching a documentary on Pearl Harbor and those poor soldiers that were buried alive and or drowned in a watery grave in the battleship Arizona, I believe. Oh, it was hideous to see that. And, and just, you know, but <clears throat> it's, it's, it's so true. The way of peace, we don't know the way to peace. Well, Micah 4 and verse 1 says this, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up into the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his way, and we will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. You know, when, when this time, what this is revealing at this time is a eagerness to learn about God's way. I mean, we've had 6,000 years to totally screw it up, our society, and <clears throat> before it's all over with, once we go through, you know, the, what the Bible refers to as the tribulation, Jacob's trouble or whatever, uh, we're going to really, you know, going to be eager to learn of God's way. And look at the response toward the law of God. Look at this response. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. You know, no longer you're going to hear this nonsense. Well, the law has been abolished, been fulfilled, been nailed to the cross, been done away with. No, the law is the very thing that's going to teach morality at this time. That's going to teach right from wrong. That's going to teach our children right from wrong. Absolutely. Micah 4 and verse 3. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. Now this is a beautiful passage where it talks about taking our military weapons and Abram tanks or whatever, and maybe turning them into tractors and farming equipments. Farming equipment, yeah. Micah 4 and verse 4. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. You know, I was watching the Lord of the Rings. I got that whole series of, you know, and the hobbits. And they, they live in a play, beautiful, you know, the rolling countryside and the hobbit houses. And they, they love to eat and they like to drink. And uh, they love to smoke their hobbit pipes. And, but it's just a, it's an imagery of a, a peaceful setting of every person enjoying the works of his hand and living off the land and just, you know, just, just loving life. You know, war is the worst thing. And God is going to make the planet great again. When this time comes to pass, we're going to learn something about God that most people overlook. And that is God wants his people to live at peace and to be happy. That sounds so simplistic, does it not? Okay, live at peace and be happy. It should be a song. Don't worry, be happy. But you know, we're not good at doing it as a nation. Just look how divided our nation is right now. Now I wanna offer you something about this coming time in the future. It's three different things I wanna offer you. One is the Feast of Tabernacles, when the whole world will celebrate before God. And this deals with this soon coming kingdom of God, when God will rule this world. Also, the coming utopia 
your part in training future leaders. Like I said, God's been calling out his cabinet members and uh, you might be a part of that. You never know, but you, you, know, you need this information. I'll send it to you free of charge. Uh, also, a glimpse of tomorrow's world. And this is something sort of thick cardstock. You can actually frame this and hang it on your wall for a great encouragement when you get down and out. These scriptures, a glimpse of what tomorrow's world will be like. You know, never give up hope. I know when you look at your society, especially when you get a little bit older and you get some wisdom inside of you, you know, you look at it and you say, what, what in the world is happening? What is going on? How is this society ever gonna get better? You know, and there is a promise that, that, that you know, that, that Jesus, the answer is for Christ to return to this earth. You know, Jesus said, when you pray, say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which really is an acknowledgement that this is not God's world and God's will is not being done here right now. That's the reason we're praying for him to return and to set up his kingdom on this earth. Order this free material. I'll send it to you free of charge. Won't beg you for money and I won't bother you after you get the material. So let's remember the words and be encouraged by the fact that God's kingdom is coming to this earth. And let's look forward to the first 100 days of Jesus Christ's presidency. I'm David Freeman, and that's what's really in your Bible. Man has the intellectual capacity to design spaceships to take him to the moon and back, to invent the computer, and to do other marvelous exploits in the physical, material realm. Yet during man's nearly 6,000 years on Earth, he has proved that he cannot solve his problems with fellow men. Through the ages, man has tried to bring about a utopian paradise by every conceivable means, yet without success. He has attempted to live by every imaginable type of government. He has even tried living without any government at all, absolute anarchy. All of them have failed miserably. Why has this been so? Jesus Christ is going to return to set up his kingdom on this earth. And right now, God is in the process of training future leaders that will teach true education. But what is true education? Find out by ordering The Coming Utopia. In this publication, you will learn of God's system for re-educating society. Order by writing to Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. That's Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151.